Welcome to The Big Rich Show. This podcast will focus on conversations with friends and acquaintances within the four-wheel drive industry. Many of the people that I will be interviewing, you may know the name, you may know some of the history, but let's get in depth with these people and find out what truly makes them a four-wheel drive enthusiast. So now's the time to sit back, grab a cold one, and enjoy our conversation. Whether you're crawling the Red Rocks of Moab or hauling your toys to the trail, Maxxis has the tires you can trust for performance and durability. Four wheels or two. Maxxis tires are the choice of champions because they know that whether for work or play, for fun or competition, Maxxis tires deliver. Choose Maxxis. Dread victoriously. Why should you read Four Low Magazine? Because Four Low Magazine is about your lifestyle, the four wheel drive adventure lifestyle that we all enjoy. Rock crawling, trail riding, event coverage, vehicle builds, and do it yourself tech all in a beautifully presented package. You won't find Four Low on the newsstand rack, so subscribe today and have it delivered to you. On today's episode of Conversations with Big Rich, we have none other than the American badass. J.T. Taylor. Anybody, I know it always kind of drives him nuts when people call him that, but J.T. is really a good dude. He's, uh, anybody that's not met him, you'll find that he's got a heart of gold, even though he comes across kind of gruff, and he's got a long history in off-road and other various motorsports, anything with a motor, basically. So we'll get into that. And uh, J.T., I want to say thank you so much for coming on board and glad we were finally able to make this happen yeah no i really appreciate it rich it's uh it's an honor to, to be on here and and chat with you about the stuff that we both love correct so let's uh let's get started right off with you know where were you born and raised i was born in bradenton florida raised there for a while and then um ended up finishing up growing up in uh, Mayaka, florida so in between Bradenton and Wachula, graduated from uh, Hardy County High there in Wachula, Florida. Okay. Let's talk about those early years. I know your dad was a pilot. How early did you get into flying? Oh, man, I can remember flying with my pops. Man, I was four or five. Okay. And uh, I can remember <laughs> standing up behind one of the front seats, hanging on to the back of the front seat, him flying and hitting a little dip and I like went down to the floor on my butt and my mom was laughing at me, asked me what happened. I said, the grease went out of my knees. (laughs) (laughs) That's funny. So any, uh, any instances like, uh, we had one, um, I, I can't remember who it was right now that they went flying with their dad. It may have been Jack Bettio and the dad went inverted rolled over and flew upside down and he fell out of the plane what yeah and didn't get but didn't get hurt good lord no no dad um he liked to fly low and slow okay and uh most of the time we never even had the doors on the plane and uh so it was kind of like riding around in a jeep but you know just just sightseeing and low and slow and he never really did anything too crazy he'd like to buzz the neighbors and buzz my uncles and aunt's house my grandma's house and let him know we were around but that was about it that was about it he was he was a good pilot so i i've been out to the property in Mayaka, and it's it's pretty rural um florida there's not a whole lot of hills Uh -uh. um, (laughs) except for ant hills um yep what was it what was it like growing up out there in that that rural situation was that that would that was the family home correct yeah, no, it was awesome. It was a lot of hard work. I mean, we we raised cows and we raised oranges and, um, you know, so anybody that knows farming is, it's not easy and you're you're uh, always subject to the weather and, um, you know, we were always scared of a freeze because that, that kills your oranges and then you don't have a crop and then you don't make any money. Right. So, but it was awesome. I mean, you know, riding around, driving on dirt roads, learning how to slide around corners and I don't know how many 22 shells I shot when I was a kid, but it was a lot. So we were always hunting and 
riding and shooting and just being country kids and uh you know chasing each other around the orange groves on motorcycles and throwing green oranges at each other knocking each other off motorcycles <laughs> you know it's a wonder we lived through it so what was the first vehicle you got to drive uh or ride man i don't know it was probably an old uh nine in tractor when i was like six that's awesome <laughs> so um but yeah i mean there was a, a big red three-wheeler that i had that or i didn't have it was my dad's it was our work rig but i beat that poor thing like it owed me money <laughs> so the school that you probably went to you had to get bust to it because i i don't remember there being passing any schools nearby that you could have walked to well, it was funny because we live right on the edge of Hardy County. We actually live in Man- Manatee County. Okay. But um, Dad wanted me to go to Wachula to school. Um, they had a better ag program. The FFA program there was good. Um, and it was, you know, more of a rural school. And so my cousin Regina and I would, I would drive over, pick her up. We would drive to the county line, park the car, and I, this was before I even had a license. I was 14, 15. <laughs> and uh, park it in one of the neighbor's yards and then catch the bus because the bus would come to the county line. Okay. And then it was, a, I don't know, over an hour bus ride to school. So you but, were uh, future farmers of America? Yep. Um, in high school, I was the parliamentarian for two years, and then my senior year, I was the president. Okay. And what was your, uh, did you just do cattle or did you start with sheep or pigs or anything else? Rabbits? Um, no, I did um, a steer when I was in 4-H, when I was way younger. Okay. Um, but then when I was in the FFA, it, I didn't really do any of the show show stuff. It was just, you know, helping run the club and, and do the, uh, like the parliamentary procedure competitions and stunt things like that. Okay. And did you uh, did you play any sports while you were in high school, or was it too much work around the 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 farm and ranch to do? No, I never really got into playing sports. I mean, um, you know, I did a little three wheeler racing, um, but that was about it. You know, as far as as doing sports, but you know, I always went to the game, went to the football games, and supported the teams and all that. But just never really got into the being a part of the sports thing. Okay. And uh, what was the first vehicle that you owned and besides uh, or were given so that you could uh, to drive around? What was it? It was, uh, oh God, what year was that thing? It was a 79 Datsun uh, 510, a little hatchback. Ooh, a 510. Okay, cool. Yeah, I wish I had it now. You know what those things are worth? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Love the five tens, especially the little four door coupes. Yeah, this one was a little two door hatchback, and that, it yeah. it uh, it jumped really good, landed bad. <laughs> I had a two ten um, that my parents had, and I took it to college when my oh Volkswagen... no, you're right, it was it was a two ten. Oh, okay, two ten. It was a two 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 door. Yep. yep. Is those things for a small motor? I ran from the cops four times. Um, in that thing in the San Francisco Bay Area, <laughs> once from the Highway Patrol and three times from from police, and they couldn't catch me. That is funny. You just you could lay that thing out in the corner on those little one fifty five eighty thirteen tires or twelve yeah thirteens I think. Yeah, they and were just tiny. Slide the corners. <laughs> Rear yep, wheel drive. <laughs> oh yeah, no, I did find that uh, the e brake comes in handy when you're. When you go past the state trooper and you see him stop and flip and you go lights out, <laughs> that you can dip off into a neighbor's driveway by using the parking brake so your brake lights don't come on. So he just goes right on by you. Yep, that works. Ditch him. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's awesome. So you did some three wheeler racing locally there in that, in Manatee County or? Yeah, yeah, they're in Hardy County and just. It was it was nothing to speak of really, um, just for fun. Okay. 
and uh, FFA in in high school, and then you went after high school. Is that when you went into the military right away, or did you work for a while, or what happened? No, I actually joined the army in the on the uh, delayed entry program in eleventh grade. So oh, wow. I was already signed up. So when I graduated, I was out for a month and twenty eight days, and I was on a plane headed to to Fort Bliss in El Paso for basic training. Wow. Okay. Cool. And I landed in Fort Bliss. I'm looking out the window of the plane. I'd never seen desert before. And I'm like, oh, what did I do? <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about that time. What was what was it like as a, a young man and jumping out into into the real world? Um, it was fun. Um, you know, I mean, basic training was brutal. It was hard. But it was still fun. It was a challenge. I liked the the leadership roles because, you know, in basic training in AIT, they move you around. They put you in a leadership position for a while, and then they, they fire you, and they put somebody else in there. And it's just how it works. But I didn't like getting fired. I didn't like not being in the leadership position because I, I enjoyed it. And it was, it was a challenge, and it was fun. Um, but once I understood that that was how it worked, then I was okay. But at first, I was pissed. <laughs> I can understand that. I my leadership stuff started with scouting um, mm-hmm. as a patrol leader, then senior patrol leader, all that kind of stuff. And um, I never went into the military, but every job I ever had, I wasn't satisfied with just being, you know, one of the shop guys or just being, you know, whatever. Um, it was always, you know, how can I move up? How can I move up? And that must have been the same for you then if you started off, you know, as in FFA um, doing, you know, being the president and parliamentarian that, you know, you had that that knack. Yeah. No, I never put two and two together on that. But, yeah, I think you're right. Okay. And it it's it kind of, you know, I see that same thing with you to this day. So that's, uh, you know, I think that comes early for most people you're either you know a leader or a follower and uh i know that a lot of us that are in the racing one way or another were more leaders than followers and uh, yeah there's there's a lot of a lot of alphas in our <laughs> in our sport <laughs> yeah we'll get into that being race director here in a little while <laughs> yeah <laughs> so but, no i i agree and it um uh, all that the leadership stuff from early all the way through the military is you know i i kind of laughed about a lot of the stuff that we had to do in the army and and the you know leadership training that i had to go through didn't really see how much it meant while i was doing it but you know once i went back to the unit after one of the training events you know you could put it put it to work put the stuff to you that you learned to work but then when i got out and you know, moving into the racing world, it, it's really paid off. Right. And how many years did you spend in the military? 21 years. 21 years. And was any of that like in guard or was it just active no, duty? No, it was all active duty. Okay. And uh, let's talk about some of those 21 years. After Fort Bliss, where did you end up? Um, <clears throat> I was lucky enough to have a good recruiter. And um, he got me the Europe option. Um, so I got a sign-on bonus, and I got to go to Europe. So I went straight from AIT. Uh, so I did basic training and AIT right there in Fort Bliss uh, in the Air Defense Artillery. And then I went to Spangdalem Air Base in Germany, which is down by Trier and Luxembourg. It's in the corner down in the Mosul region. So great wine region, beautiful scenery, great people just a really really good experience i spent four years there um and then came to fort carson in colorado springs um got super lucky because several of my friends from germany came to fort carson and i got to come here so i already had already had a, a, a friend base here so that made things easier is that difficult for a lot of people that are in the military is if you're changing locations, you know, if you're, you're more than your, your basic, you know, four year guy, 
and you're moving around a lot, is it is it difficult going from spot to spot and being a new guy? Do you think? Yeah, it used to, man. They would they uh, were moving people like every eighteen months. So, and it was their policy back then, and it, nobody understood it. But they were trying to keep, you know, things to where you kept you keep changing up, changing command, and changing up people, and training in different areas, different you know personalities. But it, it you couldn't build a cohesive unit very well. It was hard. So then they slowed down on that, which I was lucky to be in when they started slowing down on that. Because I was supposed to be in Germany for two years. I signed up for an extension because they were hurting for people. So I got it to stay three. Well, then I re-enlisted because uh, I had orders to go to Fort Riley, Kansas. Didn't really want to do that. Uh, no offense to the Kansases. But uh, <laughs> I didn't want to go to Fort Riley. And um, so I uh, re-upped for another year. And then I got to choose my station, and so I chose Fort Carson. And what made you pick Fort Carson? Um, I just told, heard a lot of really good things about it. Um, I had spent time out in Colorado uh, going to Gunnison when I was a kid. And so I liked Colorado. I liked the whole the mountains and the, just everything about it. And the training area at Fort Carson is good. They got the other one down at Pena Canyon that's, that's a good training area. Um, so yeah, and just the unit had the fourth ID at the time had a good reputation. So and I had friends that had left from Germany and came to Colorado, so that that helped. Okay. And what were the type of duties that you you performed? Um, it's it you said something about artillery. I was in the air defense artillery. Started out on the Vulcan weapon system. Okay. Um, and so it's a six barreled 20 millimeter Gatlin gun that fires 3000 rounds a minute. And basically you just throw up a wall of lead at a plane or a helicopter and, you know, get it to run into it. <laughs> so that's cool. <laughs> um, oh man, they hooked me. They showed me that video at the recruiter's office and it was in Panama and it was a toad Vulcan, a trailer model, like cutting a building in half. And I'm like, done, sign me up. I want that. <laughs> And, so, um, so, so yeah, I mean, the daily stuff at Fort Carson, you know, it's, it's maintenance and motor pool and training and, you know, then you'd get ramped up and you'd go like to NTC out the national training center out in, um, Barstow, California okay, and do, you know, war games, exercises and, you know, continue training. It's, it was all about training and, um, maintenance and leadership training <clears throat> So, and that's no matter where you are or what you do, it's, it's always the same in the army, at least. Right. Um, prepare for that day. Exactly. Um, so after, let's see, that was 1990 to, damn, when was that? <laughs> it was 90 to 94. I was here and then I went to Korea for a year. Um, and that was interesting. Korea is, man, it's hot as the surface of the sun in the summer and then cold like Siberia in the winter. Um, humid, humid. Yeah, it is. It's humid. So it's, man, it'll, it'll cut you. It's so cold and so hot. But, um, I traveled all over, uh, me and my buddy, Steve favorite, we we learned the train system and we'd get on the train and we'd go to Seoul and we'd go down to Pusan and we'd go up to, you know, DMZ and go to Freedom Village, you know, see all that stuff. So we traveled a lot. I mean, I did the same in Germany. Um, we, uh, we went all over like every weekend we were gone somewhere. Um, but did the same thing in Korea. Couldn't have cars. So we, you know, rode buses and rode the trains and, and all that, but got to see a lot of cool history and, a lot of a lot of cool stuff. So was that a military rule? You couldn't own a car over there. Yeah, that, I don't. I never understood why. But now in Korea, it's a hardship tour, so you can't. Uh, they won't pay for your family to come with you, and you can't have a car. Okay. At least up where we were. A lot of it was because the bases are so small. Okay. That if 
every soldier had a car, you wouldn't be able to move. Right. Okay, that makes sense. So I volunteered to go to Korea so I could get my station of choice follow-on, and I chose Fort Carson. So I got to come back to Fort Carson. Then spent a couple more years here, then went to Korea again. Same kind of deal. They were hurting for people over there, volunteered to go, and got to pick my follow-on. So I chose Fort Carson. Nice. And then um, uh, Iraq came about, so deployed to Iraq with 3rd Armored Cav. Um, and 0304. And then uh, back to Carson and retired in 06. Okay. And when did you start the racing? Um... I built Old Blue, well, because I raced in Germany. I raced circle, dirt circle track in a oh, Volkswagen. Okay. In a Volkswagen? Um, yeah, we had a, a circle, a, a quarter-mile medium bank clay oval there on Spangdalem Air Base, like right on the, on the backside of the air base. And so I built a little bug, um, cut it down, and, you know, made it low and low slung. And we I raced the uh, 1600 stock class, which... I was, it wasn't stock. I was cheating. Everybody was cheating. Well, yeah. But, but um, race 1600 stock class for a couple of years. And then I built a super modified car with a five cylinder fuel injected turbocharged Audi mounted mid engine in a little single seat, kind of a sprint car looking thing. Okay. Um, that was a death trap. It was fast. <laughs> 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 um, so I raced there, and then when I got back to the States, I looked at – there's a track just south of, of me here that I looked at. It's a like a 5.8 uh, asphalt. Right. And I went down there and was looking at buying a car, but the the people at the time down there were, I mean, just not, not friendly, not good. It was just real clicky, and it just didn't – it looked like nobody was having fun racing. Circle jerks. Yeah, man, it was not good, and so I, that turned me off to that, and then some friends of mine were into wheeling, and I, I'd always been into, you know, playing around off-road, and never really got into rock crawling, but I got here, and I, um, God, the first one was a little 83 Toyota uh, pickup, and I had big tires on it. They were 33s. They were huge. <laughs> and uh, wheeled that thing all over the place here in Colorado because, man, there's some amazing wheeling here in Colorado. Right. And um, then, you know, moved up from there. I built a Land Cruiser and then went crazy with it and made it, like, super nice show car, <laughs> badass rig. And um, then I built that black 85 Toyota that you've seen. Right. Um, old Black Sunshine. That was a good truck. And you sold that, didn't you? I did, again. I yeah. sold it and bought it back, then I just I sold it again. Wow. And uh, it's up in uh, Montana doing off-road recovery work. Okay. And the guy loves it. So, at least I don't have to see it running around town. <laughs> so. Because that would, hurt, that would hurt my feelers. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. There's, if I would have known that I really, that I, I've had vehicles in my life that I really wish I had not gotten rid of now. But of course, I needed to get rid of them at the time because I needed the money or whatever the situation was. It was never like, ah, I'm tired of this, get rid of it. It was always like, okay, I got to, you know, I got to move up to something else or, you know, whatever. And I really wish I had some of those vehicles back. It, do you have that case as well? I know that you bought the Toyota back and you've sold it now. Is there anything else? Um, I sold my Land Cruiser to Dan Smith, my, one of my best friends from high school down in Florida, and he had it for a while, and then I got it back. Um, and then I, I sold it again. I, I kind of wish I'd kept that one because it was, it was cool. It was a really good-looking rig, and it was fun. Um, it was two port injected small block Chevy, uh, with a Muncie 465, Dana 300, Terra Low, 
three to one, uh, nine inch rear Detroit. You know, I stretched the wheelbase, chopped the windshield frame down three and a half inches. Uh, cause for some reason that they thought that every American was six foot six with a cowboy hat on. So they made those line crews really tall. So I chopped it down. Um, but it was a good looking rig and, and it was a lot of fun. And, uh, yeah, I kind of wish I still had that one. That's understandable. The FJ 40, right? Yes, sir. Okay. And, uh, you built old blue sometime after the, after the military? Uh, no, I came back from Iraq in 04. Okay. And um, that's when the Avalanche Ranch was going on. And uh, I went over there with my buddy Dave Jones and uh, Crash. You remember Harrison Bean? Yep. Old Crash? Yep. I went over there with him, and Dave rode with him on a couple obstacles, on a couple courses, and then I rode with him on Aliens and the other one that was like a snake. I can't remember the name of it. But i was hooked absolutely hooked and so i told crash that i wanted to build one of his chassis so we spent it was about three months straight and um built old blue and uh you know it was the first buggy i'd ever built and uh crash and dave and got a bunch of other friends everybody pitched in and we finished it, rolled it out of the shop, onto the trailer, went to Moab, and raced it at the first XRA race there that time it snowed. Correct. And um, my total driving time in the car was from the shop to the trailer. Okay. <laughs> so, I, I think a lot of guys do that nowadays still. Yeah. Yeah. You know how much time it takes to get ready for a race? <laughs> all, all the time you have yes every waking moment yep and plus so, more but yeah old blue was i mean i still got it it was a it was a good car man we did a lot of firsts with that with that car so avalanche ranch that's uh was steve ramore from avalanche yep. engineering and yep. he uh that was uh that n south very far southwest colorado just outside of durango yeah, I did a, a rock crawl there um, back in the day, and then oh, that's and then that's how we got involved with it. And then then he had all sorts of problems with uh, with the county or the state or I forget what it was. It was, it was county. County. Yeah, okay. people that didn't like him. Right. That's a shame because it was a nice place. Yeah, you gotta love politics. Yeah. So um, I was at that first xra event as well that uh they put on rich and i with uh we rock had done the race or the rock crawl the week before on the big on saturday and we got we started to get snow there on oh, i think it was like Mon sunday or monday tuesday and then it snowed off and on all week long if i remember right but we helped uh we helped the weavers out with that first event after doing our rock crawl there. So it was That's cool. I don't even remember that, man. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Cause one of our recommendations at that first XRA was to build four courses like a, 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 a one and two and a B one and two. So that if you had a, if they had a breakdown or a rollover or a delay, they could move the cars over to the B courses so that they could keep the flow going. Yep. And then afterwards I told them, you can't do a lunch break because you're going to lose your crowd. And they continued to do lunch breaks. But one of these days <laughs> I'll get Weaver on here and we'll talk, we'll talk to him about all that. So I talked to him not long ago. Oh yeah. How was that? Yeah. It was awesome. It was great to catch up with him. He and Jody are still doing good. And yeah. It was very cool to catch up with him. And are they down in Alabama or are they in Tennessee? Uh, Tennessee. Tennessee, okay. So, XRA, let's talk talk about your time there. That was so much fun. It was, it was so cool because you could really hang it out because your trailer's not far away. Right. You know, 
it was all short, short runs and just, there was all a sprint. There was no, there was no strategy to it. You just had to go, you know, Weaver was diabolical. He would come up some, with some courses that would kick your butt. What was your favorite place to race with XRA? I loved Moab, but I think I'm going to have to go with Ram. Those jumps at Ram were just terrifyingly fun. True. <laughs> I can remember, I think it was the first race there. There was uh, some guys hesitated on the, the second part of that double. Yeah. Or, you know, yeah. they off the first double across the gap. That wasn't uh, That wasn't a good idea. Yeah, no, you, no, you had to stay on it. Um, of course, Matt Thompson and I, one time, we jumped that the first one, landed, and normally you lift and then roll back into it to hit that triple. Well, I didn't lift. We hit that triple, <laughs> and we were in low Earth orbit. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we were in the air long enough that we talked about it. So, it was... We were high, and it landed, and um, I was had to jam the, the throttle to get it to pull out, but then jam the brakes because then we hit that wall that was after that and bounced off of it, and off we went again. So I almost screwed that up because, man, we I way overjumped that one. And besides Ram, what were uh, some of the locations that you raced at? Um, we did a couple different locations there in Cortez. Um, that was pretty fun. The rock quarry right there by town was a blast jumping off that that big ledge because we were all talking about it. It's like, man, that's crazy. Nobody's going to do that. Da, 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 da. And I don't remember who the first one to jump off it was, but it might have been Shane Chittix. But then after that, everybody jumped it. And it was cool because you jump jump off this I don't know, six or eight foot vert ledge and land on the down ramp. And so it, it, it hurt, but it didn't hurt like it looked like it was going to hurt. Right. You know, of course, we were all running small coilovers and air shocks at the time. So, you know, the suspension technology wasn't, we weren't running what all the good stuff yet. So did you run mostly west or that mountain area that he, that they competed in, or did you go east at all? Um, Mark Munson and Rob Dubrock and I loaded up that one time and went back for the very first East Coast XRA there at, uh, Paragon. Okay. And, um, got to race there. Um, uh, there was guys there. John Boring was there. Uh, Eric Miller was there. This 17 year old kid and this beat up little TJ. The gold one. And, yeah. He was beating that thing like it owed him money. And, uh. <laughs> So, yeah, that was the first time I got to meet him. and um, Then we got to do some wheeling around the park after the, the event, and that place was amazing. It's a, it's a shame that you can't wheel there anymore. Right. I agree 100%. Yeah, we did this one drop-off. This uh, guy named Mikey was spotting me off this one drop-off that, man, it was, it was big. It had an undercut, and you just kind of fell off of it, and... Uh, Munson was, he was not happy when we dropped off that thing. He was looking for something to hang on to. <laughs> <laughs> so a story, the, the first time Rogie and I went out there, we helped set up the first, um, event that they did out there that, that Kyle Knopf's did. And it was a E-Rock event. Yep. Or new, no, excuse me. New Rock. It was a new rock event. And we're driving around looking at the place. And then we started setting courses, and Bob had flown out. I had driven the XJ out with both his dad and my dad, which was absolutely a hilarious trip. And <laughs> then, because we looked at other locations on the way there, well, we get right. to uh, we get out there and we're wheeling around, and we're driving um, Kyle's Jeep, and it only had a B hoop, B pillar hoop no full cage and rogie's i mean he's he's wheeling it like it was his commando and at one point he goes well without a front cage put a rope on the back and hold me as i drop off of this and it was some big boulder and we got all done for the day and 
kind of knew where we were going to set up courses and stuff and walked through with big Kyle and little Kyle on how to, you know, how we set courses and what the, the process was and the mindset. And little Kyle goes, so what do you think of our, our rocks? And, uh, Bob in typical Bob fashion go, Oh, your rocks are great, but I don't know why you guys always drive around them because oh. there was no trails off the rocks. It was like right along the edges of them. And, yeah. you know, it was a t- typical, you know, rogueism, you might say. <laughs> I've never known rogue to speak his mind. That's, <laughs> that's a... <laughs> oh, man. I've yeah. got to get him on the, on the interview one of these times if I can, if I can ply him with enough uh, adult barley pops first to, to uh, loosen yeah, him up. Yeah, I think you have to loosen him up a little bit first. <laughs> So during the XRA years, is that when you got into desert racing or was it, uh, hill climbing stuff first? Um, I think it was desert race first because Jason Berger and, uh, Andrew Berger raced with us and, uh, they had that badass buggy that Jason's a wheel man, man. He could drive. Yes. And, uh. We used to, we met, you know, racing, and so we used to always, you know, have our our time slips from our races, and it's like, what'd you, what'd you do? You show me yours first. What'd you do? You know, and we'd always give each other shit, and uh, it was it was a lot of fun racing against those guys, and uh, he knew I had retired in October, and so he calls me early November, and he goes, hey, man, what are you doing uh, here in a couple of weeks? And I was like, well, funnily enough, my schedule is pretty free right now. <laughs> right. <laughs> and uh, he said, you want to go to Mexico? I'm like, sure, what for? He goes, to Baja 1000. I was like, yeah, what's going to cost? He goes, no, we're going to get paid. I'm like, uh, okay, what are we going to do? He's like, we're chasing a, a class one for the Baja 1000. Sign me up. So um, the way it worked is Jason Berger is good friends with Jeff Rock who was one of the key people on speed technologies team out of uh, Reno. And they were campaigning a class one car with uh, John Hera. And I can't remember who the other driver was, but um, yeah, we went, went down there and that was my first foray into desert racing. And that, that hooked me pretty hard because man, I love me some Baja. Yeah, Baja's kind of a mystical spot, really. Yeah. And it doesn't matter if you're there for racing or just touring. It's uh, it's like being in the Old West. Rules yeah. aren't written typically. I mean, the rules are there, but it's not It's not kind of the same. Yeah, it's... People ask me about it, and I, the best way I can explain it is is it's fun and scary and awesome and dangerous and the food's amazing the people are amazing the scenery is crazy it changes so much from the the joshua trees to the the Bujum trees to the beaches to the cactuses going right down to the salt water you know and and it's still it is still kind of wild wild west it's 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 sketchy and you can you can get hurt and you can get dead you know if you're not careful right um but that you know, and especially with the racing stuff, that's it's as close as I've found to combat to get your adrenaline up. Oh wow! Okay. And you were crewing for Speed Technologies for John Hera, correct? Yep. Yeah, I went from volunteer guy, tire changer guy, to the crew chief in a year. Wow. And then uh, 2008 was the first year that I it was my plan it was my logistics my plan everything for the thousand and uh, we won it in class one with John Herger and Joe Whining and Chuck Dempsey and uh, Ray so we uh, Herger took it out front early 
and uh, was just running away. Um, had a couple good fights in there, but Herter kept the lead, handed it off to Dempsey, and uh, Dempsey brought it home, and we won it. So that was, a, that was a pretty big deal. I'm sure you've seen there's that poster in my bathroom in the shop. Right. That's signed by Herter and Hera and um, Joe and Dempsey and all those guys, you know, for winning that 2008. But that was – I was pretty proud of that. It was my first – big crew chief gig and uh, we pulled off a win that's that's pretty awesome so who else have you raced with down there besides speed technologies um god steve appleton uh, with Ooh, bad bad apple. apple racing yeah i miss that guy he was a really good dude um cory keys are um Shannon Campbell, Mike Palmer, Pat Sims. That's, you know, the past several years I've been racing with Pat Sims. Uh, Terry Madden and I this year ran the first 433 miles in that spec trophy truck, uh, the 211 of Pat Sims. And um, we did okay. We finished 13th, but we uh, got Pat uh, another milestone award. So two years in a row, milestone award. Um, the Wilson boys out, at, out of uh, Boulder City. Uh, prep the car and jeff wilson their dad is the the crew chief and uh they do a hell of a job and uh then there's pat he's you know walking talking cartoon character <laughs> so then uh you raced no you bought the elf class 11 correct it, it, i did uh so yeah i raced uh the Nora Mexican 1000, the first one in 2010, um, with the dirt sports team. Um, it was Jim and Kurt and Marty Fioca and myself. So I co-drove and mechanic. And then those three guys swapped out driving. And, um, we had a rollover incident with the elf and it got squished and uh, Jim was pretty, pretty upset about it, but you know, it's, it's racing and it happens. But then he parked it for a while and didn't do anything with it. So I finally talked him out of it and I bought it from him and we fixed it and then went and raced Nora with it for two years and had a blast. That thing was such fun to drive. Um, and then I ended up selling it to, uh, Greg from rugged. Okay. And he redid it beautifully. I mean, it is showroom and it's sitting in their showroom at, the new rugged shop oh okay i so, wondered what happened to it yep she's got a, a happy healthy home so it's it's pretty cool when i see videos that greg does at the rugged shop and i see it in the background it makes me smile yeah because when that car was built it was supposed to be class 11 but yep it didn't fit the score class 11 rules quite i guess is that no no, it didn't. They, I don't know where the disconnect was on that, but it's funny because we were at Horsepower Ranch with Speed Tech, and then that car showed up. Mike and Jody Weaver were with it, and it showed up, and it wouldn't run. So me and Berger went over there and were looking at it, and I knew Volkswagens from racing them. So, so they had uh, stuck the distributor 180 out. <laughs> so I had turned it over. I heard that, so I said, stop. I pulled the distributor, lined it up, re-stabbed it. And he got it fired up, and Jody, Mike and Jody comes walking over. Mike's like, how the hell did you do that? He's like, people have been trying to get that thing started for two days. I'm like, well, the distributor was 180 out. <laughs> um, so, yeah, that was I got to see that car back then. But, yeah, they ended up having to run it in Sportsman. And uh, Jason Shearer was supposed to get in the car, so he, went, he rode with us down to the road going into Bay of L.A. and was hanging out with us. And, well, we had a an issue in a silt bed and got a, bro a shock broken we got run into and then of course the elf didn't make it to him so none of us got to see either race car down there but that's, that's the story of baja yep absolutely so, but yeah it, uh, it it's just crazy how early you know with being around sheer and burger and and 
being around that car and then it just comes full circle and then end up owning the car. You know, it's just, it's crazy. It's all this weird and incestuous little world that we live in. I agree. And it's, and it's off road. It, that's the nature of off road. It's like with businesses in off road and it doesn't matter. It doesn't seem to matter what, but you know, you go to SEMA one year and you collect a bunch of business cards and the next year you go see those same people and they have a new business card, but they're still an off-road. They're just, yep. they're just with a different company. And yep, it's true. just, nobody ever leaves. Very few people ever leave off-road. They just kind of like migrate to another spot. <laughs> That's true. Changing business cards. Mm, yep. I know that well. <laughs> so then you, uh, yeah, yeah, you do, don't you? Um, so then when did, uh, the relationship with Torchmate and Bill get started? Um, yeah, shoot, I forgot about that race with Torchmate with, uh, Bill Koontz and, uh, Greg Jones and Mark Leverett and, uh, Brad Lovell, um, uh, Jake Povey, uh, <laughs> Nick Sosha, you know. And Just, that was the a class seven. It was. It was a class seven truck. Um, that V six would cut a hole in you with that resonance that it had. <laughs> um, but uh, that was, man. When was that? I don't even remember the year, man. But yeah, we raced that that seven truck a couple times. Uh, Marty Fioka, I co drove with him that one year in that truck. Um, and then, God, I remember that we were in between Mike's over behind Simpsons, you know, when that, that little Oak Grove that's in there. Right. And it was cool. So I opened my visor and a bee flew in and stung me right in the face. And I was like, ow. And Marty's like, what happened? I was like, a bee got me and he's freaking out. Are you allergic? Are you okay? What do we do? I'm like, shut up and drive Marty. I'm good. Go. (laughs) (laughs) uh but yeah that that was a great time um bill is a really really great american just just good absolutely agree uh, yep jones the old greg jones man he's crazy but such a good dude um man he would if you want if you want something tested, let him drive it. Cause man, he was hard on equipment, <laughs> but, <laughs> but yeah, that led into, you know, me working for Torchmate and being their, um, sponsorship manager. Right. So like all the packets would come into me and I would review them and figure out who we were going to sponsor and, you know, who was a good fit for a marketing partner and who wasn't, um, and that was fun. It was, it was a different kind of gig, but it was, it was fun. And then we built the TTB car, you know, it was a Jesse Haynes design with Nick Socia in there and, um, Kat and Mark Leverett and, um, Mike just, I mean, a lot of effort, a lot of people getting in on that car and, and, you know, it was, it was different, you know, doing a twin traction beam front end, a lot of people thought it wouldn't work. And, you know, the whole build was on pirate and just amazing work. The welding that those guys can do. I mean, it just blows my mind. And then the design, cause you know how Jesse's brain works. It, it, it'll hurt your head. Like looking at the steering that he, that they came up with on this car. It, it'll hurt your head. Right, but, but it worked. Yeah, there was no bump steer through the whole thing, and it just would get down in the rough stuff. It, Man, it worked good. Um, so, yeah, I, I ended up, well, you knew I got that car back, but then I sold it. I sold it to Bill. He owns it now. Right. He's, and I think he's campaigning it um, again this last year. He is. He is. He and Jake Povey are are racing it, and um, they've done pretty good. They've podiumed a couple times. He had an oops at Sturgis, and he he put it upside down, and I was the first one to him. 
and uh, he's like, I'm happy and not happy to see you. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I always tell people when uh, when we were doing the dirt riot racing is that you know you didn't you didn't want to see me or Josh when Josh was still working with us yep. while the race was going on because that means there was a problem. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. You're either crashed or in trouble. Yes. <laughs> That's funny. So what was the favorite car you ever got to drive? Maybe not even in a race situation. And I think the fastest, well, I know the fastest one I ever drove was a, uh, a rough turbo 911 in Germany on the Autobahn. Oh. At 155 miles an hour. In the Autobahn. So. And that's that's a legal unlimited speed limit, isn't it? The section w- that we were on, yeah, it was unlimited. So, yeah, that was, that was pretty amazing. Because you slow down and you think you're crawling. It's like you feel like you can get out and walk and you look down and you're doing 80. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, when it, when you get above 120, things happen really, really fast. True, very true. But um, that was probably the coolest, like, go fast car I've ever gotten to drive. Off road race car. I'm I'm gonna have to go to the TTB man. That thing, that is a great car. And I'm really happy that Bill's got it and he's campaigning it because I, with being the race director and running all those races, I just couldn't give that thing the the love that it needed and get it campaign and campaign it the way it needed to be run right you know, that it did. so it was sitting a lot and it was a shame to let that piece of art sit so i'm glad it's back out there now how did that one compare with like burkett's car that's also the ttb do you know um, i don't know i i've never never gotten to mess with burkett's car i okay. mean it's it's a good car um, you know, he's done, done okay with it. Um, I just, I've never really, never really looked at it that close. Okay. Yeah. I don't, I, I know he raced with us a number of times, um, and won at least one, one race with it at, at canyons, um, outside of Fredericksburg, Texas. But he, uh, that's the one time that, uh, Wyatt Pemberton showed up with the unicorn to race as well. Oh, right on. Yeah, and uh, they, uh, I think the Unicorn was a little bit too big for that course, maybe, but uh, it was uh, it was quite a battle out there. But I never, I never really, I've never been the engineering nerd. I just make sure the cars are safe. You know, that my right. tech, my tech is always like, okay, belts are attached, they're not frayed. Seats are anchored in properly. Two fire extinguishers. You know, I go through the the list that way. I don't. Um, you know, it's a safety item. I don't. I don't worry about class until somebody's cheating in the class and it's brought to my attention. But right. you know, we were we were a little bit more regional and allow you know allow a little bit more. But uh, how did how did things come about? From you going from racer to being staff and race director with Dave at Ultra Four. So we had just finished the Mexican 1000 and we were down in Cabo and I was having dinner with Dave and he says, hey man, can I talk to you for a minute? And so we step away from the table and he tells me he's got throat cancer and so I freak out. And he goes, no, it's going to be okay, man. We're, uh, we'll be all right. And uh, we're going to work through this. He said, but I want you to be the race director while I'm out. And so I said, I said, yes, of course. Um, and he's like, what, I, you know, what's it going to cost me? I'm like, just pay for my travel. I said, we'll just do it that way. I, I got this. And, uh, so that's how we did it. And he already had an amazing team in place. And so it was pretty easy and fun. I mean, we had a blast doing it. It was, uh, you know, Shannon Welch, Ron Stowball, Simon Saints, Texas Jesus, Roxy, 
uh, and then Gooby was coming and doing the timing, and then Sean, Sean Wilson. Yeah, what an so, amazing guy. Oh, God, I miss Sean so much. Such a good dude. I agree. But um, but we had a blast, you know, and it went well, and, you know, and then Dave got, got healed up and came back, and he called me, and he's like, so are you are you having fun doing this? I'm like, yeah, yeah, it's pretty fun. He's like, um, do you want to do it more, or are you tired of doing it? I said, well, just ask me. <laughs> he goes, all right, fine. He said, you want to do this? He said, I'll pay you. I said, sure, let's do it. So I was there for seven years. Right. That's when you met Sean Wilson, right? Was was yes, sir. when you became the, the race director. Yep. Yeah, I met, I met Sean. He was part of the club in Cedar City, the four-wheel drive club, when I was living there. And him and Dean Bullock and Buzzy Bronsema and bunch of guys yep. good dudes that yeah awesome awesome guys and like you said yeah sean's definitely one that's missed and most people didn't even know he was around because he was so quiet and just did whatever needed to be done and just getting shit done is what sean did yes to the point yep. that it it really it really took a toll on him too yeah oh i know i know it it would suck watching him fight through that fibromyalgia and, and fight through the pain, you know, building hammers or even at a regional race. It just, it hurt watching it, you know, and, and he was so not so much stubborn, but just self-reliant that he didn't want to put it on anybody else and didn't want to be a burden to anybody. Right. But yeah, he's, uh, he is definitely missed. So let's talk about that. Those times that, at Ultra Four, and becoming the race director, what was that first race like? Because it was was it KOH was the first race you did as as. No, no, because he had already David already done, um, the Stampede. He had asked me, and then it was going to the Stampede. So that's when he announced. He went and did the race because I already had a prior commitment because I was still crew chiefing for Brad Lovell right in short form, and um, I couldn't leave Brad hanging so. I told Dave, I said, I got to go do this. I can't, I can't leave Brad out. And so he went and did that race and then announced that I was going to be the race director. So that the first one I did was uh, Badlands there at Kyle's place. Okay. And um, it was different. I mean, being on the, the, the front side of the driver's meeting instead of, you know, being talked to it, it was intimidating, you know, but, at the time, all those, all the guys and girls that were racing were my friends. And so it was, it was pretty easy. And, you know, we, we set up a good course and we had fun qualifying and, um, we went around Narnia because <laughs> screw that place. I hated that section. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was, uh, it was good, you know, and we had our, had our struggles with, with the timing and scoring for years and just, you know, just fighting through that. But, you know, Goodby always did a great job with it. Yeah, it was just a good team. And it, it really wasn't even like it was anybody in charge. It just everybody kind of got stuff done. That's one of the things I think Dave has done a really good job with is always surrounded himself with with people that were were solid and could get things, could take care of business. Yeah, no, I agree. So let's talk about, well, you, you're there for seven years. What was it like setting up King of the Hammers and dealing with everything that had to be dealt with out there? It's like a deployment. Because, <laughs> okay. I mean, face it, the lake back looks like Kandahar. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it, it's like a deployment without getting shot at. Um, it's a lot. It's, there's so many moving pieces to that, that it, it's hard to wrap your head around, you know, and being out there for five or six weeks living in the desert, um, it, it gets tiring. I mean, you get worn out, but again, 
the people that were in place, everybody just did their part. I mean, you got Travis and, and his team doing all the tech stuff and laying electrical grid and putting in internet and, you know, and uh, Tony Calkins comes out from Arkansas and uh, Lindsey Fisher from Colorado and Clint. And I mean, they just bust their butt doing all that techie stuff. And so that's something that I, I never had to mess with because, you know, it's not my lane. My lane is the race course stuff and, and marking and, and GPS and, and all that. And, um, you know, Dave would, Dave would lay out the course, you know, cause he always had it in his head a year out and, um, then I'd go out and run it and GPS it and do some tweaks here and there, but then always looking for new stuff you know, to keep adding to, um, you know, like idle issues and her problem and hell to pay and, you know, just adding some of that stuff, just change it up to make it fun. Um, but difficult. I mean, hell to pay ain't no joke and neither is idle issues. I mean, it, <laughs> they're, they're hard, but yeah, it's, it's crazy. The amount of moving pieces that's there and it takes, you know, a month to build it and five days to tear it down and we leave, you know, we would leave and it would be cleaner than when we got there, which we were all pretty proud of that, you know, went to spend a lot of time and money to hire people and to clean it ourselves. And, um, and you know, the racers did a, a really always do a good job. They, there were some of them, you know, like the poo barrel incident. I was going to bring that up. <laughs> yeah. The poo barrel incident was a, um, that was special. I don't, I don't need to do that again. <laughs> um, but I didn't have to call out the team that, that did it. And I still won't because it was an accident. It was a miscommunication and it wasn't intentional, you know, and I did some call outs on social media for people leaving trash in their pit areas. And like one of them was Dwayne Gerritsen. I called him like, Dwayne, I know you didn't leave this. Tra-. He goes, Hell no. I got pictures. I'll send them to you right now. I clean my, so somebody had put, taken their trash and put it in Dwayne's tent, you know? <laughs> yeah. So there's, there's shady, but. If there would have the been most, empty Michelob ultras, then you knew it was Dwayne Garrison's trash. <laughs> yep. Um, but yeah, he, he was adamant. He's like, no, sir. Uh, uh-uh. uh. And I said, I didn't think so. I knew you wouldn't do that to me, but. You know, once I did that a couple times, it it got way better. The racers did an amazing job the past several years of of taking their trash with them, and and we helped facilitate it better by having dumpsters more available. And so it it was a it was a hand in hand thing, but it all uh, made made the staff's life a lot easier. So the adding in during that time the expansion of the UTVs and then because the UTV thing went up and down a, a couple of years there they I did the first UTV race there and Jeff and Dave didn't want no part of it until they saw that you know we had 20 some rigs show up um, with only like you know two weeks worth of notice and then then they decided to do it and then it kind of didn't go anywhere because it was kind of like an afterthought, of course, for what they were what they were wanting to do or, or used to doing. And then and then it made a comeback. What was it like? What was it like looking at a course and having to 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 judge it or you know judge the terrain? figure it out so that you could put all those classes of vehicles across basically the same terrain. It, it was a challenge. I mean, it, it always is, um, you know, cause you don't want to throw the stock guys in on something that's just going to cause a bottleneck and break all their cars. And, cause that's not fun. That's not racing. You want them, you want them to be challenged, but you don't want to, to plug up the works and not have them racing. Um, and it used to be that way with UTVs. Not anymore, man. Those UTVs are as capable as a 4400 car. Yeah, technology's uh, really, really pushed forward with them. 
yeah, they're not golf carts anymore. They will go places that they probably shouldn't be. <laughs> but uh, they're, yeah, the technology has definitely caught up because they are legit race cars. So what was it like then adding in the T1s or the trophy trucks? That was pretty fun. Um, the challenge of building a course for them that would flow um, was pretty fun. Dave and I had, had a good time doing that. Um, and having those guys, the big names come out and race a race that we were putting on was, it was an honor to be honest. Um, you know, I'm, I'm a huge fan of all of the, all the off-road racers period, you know, but, from going way back from being a kid, you know, Ivan Stewart was one of my heroes and, you know, to have that caliber of a driver bring the, the desert trucks out and race out there. It was pretty cool. Um, I didn't want it to take away from our drivers. And I think the way it was done, it, it didn't, um, because I definitely didn't want to, you know, take away from our guys and girls that have busted their butt to get to where they are. Um, but I don't know. I, I hope everybody enjoyed it. And I, I think it went, went pretty well. And like I said, it was, it was a challenge to build the course, but it was fun. And then I got some good compliments on the backside from several of those, uh, trophy truck drivers saying that it was a, a good course. It was technical. It flowed well. It was marked well. So that was a that was a huge compliment. And then working with Jimmy Lewis on the <laughs> on Jimmy the, Lewis <laughs> with uh, King of the Motos. The yeah, amount of people did, that would come in and out on that first weekend for the moto crazy. race and stuff. Talk about that. Those guys are insane. You couldn't pay me to do that stuff on a moto. Ain't no way. And Jimmy Lewis is evil. He has a black, black heart. Because <laughs> the stuff he makes those guys do is evil. But Jimmy is such an amazing person. He just cool as a cucumber, man. I, I love working with that guy. Um, His abilities yeah. on a motorcycle are absolutely phenomenal. Oh, it's crazy. Because he yeah. rode all that stuff, you know, he just didn't walk it and, or go, okay, we're going to go up this. He actually would ride that all that stuff anyway. Yeah, I told him. I said, you probably should go get a CAT scan because I think you've got something wrong in your head. <laughs> but, uh, no, the, the motos, you know, I basically was just helping jimmy you know i didn't i didn't lay the course out or any of that but when it came to it it was you know our crew would go assist with the starts and you know setting up banners and arches and stuff like that and make sure that we had spectators back so just helping jimmy and his crew manage that part of it so it was pretty fun um crazy man yeah like yeah like you said i you couldn't pay me to do that <laughs> so in in Hammertown, was that a juggling act with, you know, getting the the regular Ultra Four teams in there, in 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 t inside the gate, for the most part, and then bringing in the UTVers and then the motor the moto guys, and then the desert racers and trying to fit oh, yeah. everybody in the same footprint as people went in and out. Yeah, absolutely. It was a, a juggling act and, um, our crew that was on that just did an amazing job. And it, uh, honestly, I don't know how they did it, but like, you know, Simon, when he was doing the assignments and stuff, he did a really good job. And then Rusty would be out there doing the parking and running people around and getting people where they need to be. And, you know, just busting his butt. And, 
you know, it was, yeah, the, the in and out of all of that is pretty amazing that it actually works. Let's talk about Europe and going over there with Dave and getting the, the European guys started with Ultra 4. So I came in after they had already got it started some, but um, yeah, I went over there and would go help with the races. Um, you know, Chris Bowler was the, or is the race director over there and he does a really good job of setting up courses and marking them. And, you know, Richard Crossland, you know, is overall of the whole thing, but they, their crew over there, I mean, God, um, Dave Robson, um, Drew, Skins, uh, Paul Church, uh, Magda, um, man, they just, they have such a really good crew that has such a love for it that it was a, a lot of fun to go and help run the race. I mean, cause they didn't, they didn't need us to be there. They completely can run that autonomously. Um, but it was a lot of fun a, to go to Europe and travel and see things and, you know, get to go back and, and see my friends over there. But, um, it was, a, it was just a joy to go help them. And, um, you know, and it was, it was awesome going to the races because when I mean, you got people from Malta and Portugal and Italy and Spain and England and Wales, just all in Germany, all together into this one group racing. And it's, it's just a blast. And I think the one thing that we did help do is we kind of got them to be together because at first going there, it's like this group would set up over there and they wouldn't socialize with that group because they're from a different country. And that, and we kind of, because of how the hammers is and the culture here and how everybody helps everybody and us talking about it and them seeing it, it, it started happening in Europe and that was pretty cool to see. Absolutely. One of the things that we tried to do with Dirt Riot and what I tried to explain to Dave the first time because, you know, and, and Dave and I will have this conversation when we do, when I do an interview with him, is that, you know, he wasn't all gung-ho about me starting Dirt Riot. And I tried to explain to him that, you know, we weren't competition. We had helped to help grow what he was doing. And at first he couldn't fathom that idea. Um, but it was basically, you know, I, my, I told him, I said, my goal is to take these guys that are regional racers or guys that want to race. And, you know, I started Dirt Riot right after the Weavers dropped XRA. Right. Because I was like, okay, you got all these short course cars, basically is what they are, short duration cars. And they're not ready to, those cars are not ready just to go turn around and go race at KOH. Right. So it's like, let's create something that's in between. I didn't want to do just a, you know, a trophy dash like, like XRA was. I wanted to do something that was repetitious so that drivers would learn what it was like to drive fast for a long period of time. Kind right, of like a training sure. school. Yep. And so I remember the first conversation I had with Derek West is he was like, man, I want to, I want to do point to point races. I want it to be, you know, two hours long and go, you know, I don't want to do over the same terrain over and over and over. And I said, well, think about it. That's how you're going to get better. And he was like, what do you mean? And I'm, you know, I, I explained, you hit that corner, you see it, you know, seven, eight, nine times, you're going to figure out how to get through it faster. And then once you do a bunch of tracks that way, the next time you go to a race course, you're going to see something. You're going to go, okay, I know what to do now. And it might be on your first lap. And it also taught guys to how to work together. Because, um, right. you know, we built what we called the Dirt Riot family. And, you know, those, those racers, when they were ready to move up to Ultra 4 and go to KOH, my idea was, you know, so that they'd be successful instead of going out there, 
going two miles or 20 miles and then having to load it back up on the trailer and never show back up because they'd spent their wad, they didn't have fun, you know, whatever. Right. And I think we were successful at that in in creating that that family type atmosphere when people showed up, you know, the Texas guys knew the California guys, the you know, the guys in the south knew, you know, the the Colorado and New Mexico guys. So that it became yep. a family where people could, you know, if they had a problem, they could share pit crews, they could, you know, share resources. Yeah, exactly. And that was our goal. And I think no, it worked. I think I, you did. I think you guys did a good job. Um, I was at several of them. And, uh, yeah, it was it was always a good, a good vibe, a good feel. Plus, I didn't let anybody get away with a bunch of shit. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's, uh, you know, that was, that's always been my personality. These are the rules. That's it. <laughs> it doesn't matter who you are. You're, you're going you're gonna to play by the same rules. Yep. No, I agree. Everybody has to be treated the same. Right. Let's see. You're uh, gone through Ultra 4. Of course, this last year, decided to call it quits and do something else. You When you when you did that, I, I got in touch with you and I said, okay, what, 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 what do you got planned? And <laughs> you were going to do some airboat racing. Um, yep. Still, still working on that. Still working on that. Um, you've been helping Doug Jackson with his um, stole events, the short takeoff and landing. Yeah, that was that's been a lot of fun. Um, I, I want to continue helping him with that when I can, because um, I really enjoyed that. That was that was cool. And then you guys coming out, Shelly helping you know, or doing the scoring was amazing. She's so good at that. And now uh, you've got something else you're doing. Um, yeah, I got hired by uh, Mid America Outdoors in Jay, Oklahoma. Um, it's a good sized park and probably one of the nicest parks I've ever been to as far as amenities. I mean, the, the bathhouses and the, you know, individual shower rooms and they got two different car washes there to wash your rigs and the main store and restaurant up front. And then it's got a great short course and it's got great riding and, yeah, we're uh, we're moving moving pretty quickly on a lot of stuff. Um, there's a new series that we're starting. Um, first race is going to be at the end of February at Jay, Oklahoma. It's called the 918 race, so it's a 91.8 mile race. Um, we've already built the course for it. It's going to be a really fun uh, 9.18 mile lap, and then do 10 laps, and we're going to race. Motos, ATVs, UTVs, and then a full complement of um, big cars. So stock all the way up through Unlimited. Okay. And it, I saw that it has a guaranteed purse. It does. The entry fees are, are good and um, affordable. And then the payouts are really good. Um, like, I... I'm thinking about building a car and going back to racing to pay off. <laughs> uh, I'm just kidding. I, I can't race my own race, but, um, but yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to travel around. we got different locations that we're going to hit. Um, and we're going to put on some, some good fun races. So they won't all be at, at J at mid America then. No, sir. Um, the schedule is just about finalized. I'm waiting on, two phone calls okay. from park, park owners, landowners, and then um, the schedule will be out very, very shortly. Can you uh, can you tell me, like, the regional area that those races will be in? Uh, Midwest, East, and we got one in Utah. Okay. Cool. Uh, so, yeah, it's, it's going to be good. It's... Uh, AOE it's American off-road endurance. All right. And what is the uh how many how many events is the series? We got a six race series. Six race series. And uh are you uh 
you looking for anybody to do scoring? Um, <laughs> Shelly told me to make sure I mentioned that. Now, I know our schedule is probably not going to line up for this year, but with what we've got going on, um, maybe in the future we can we can work together if you need us. No, we need to talk about that because I – Anytime I could have Shelly do help me do scoring, I am going to sign up for that. That's a no-brainer. Yeah, I don't know how she pulls it off. I don't either. It hurts my head. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Any, uh, I've noticed some of the, the Facebook posts about it and some of the comments. Not a lot of blowback, but it's... There's in- always going to be some. Yeah. Um, but we... We don't want to go any negative on this. We want we want people to have a set of rules that I'm working on and a schedule that if they want to go race Ultra 4, we want them to do that. But then we want them to come race with us because it's good for the industry. It's good for the racers. It's good for the sponsors. It, competition is healthy. And we are going to do this correctly and I'm not going to badmouth Ultra 4. I mean, it's my family. I'm not going to badmouth them. I'm not going to badmouth Dave. Right. No, um, not at all. I don't I don't need to go down that road. I mean, it's we went a different direction and we're still friends, you Good. know. Um I wish him the best. I wish Ultra 4 the best. I hope Hammers goes off without a hitch and that you know, with a competing series, we can just keep growing this thing, you know, make it, make it better. Right. And, and, uh, and that's, that's what happened in the early days of rock crawling. I mean, at one time there was like seven promoters. Yep. You know, and then I think what, what, what it ended up being a downfall of that was that the one promoter tried to absorb everybody else to control absolutely every facet of it. And I wouldn't buy into that. Um, right. You know, it, 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 for one thing, it didn't make financial sense for me to do that with them. So I just kept doing my own thing. And, you know, here we are 21 years later getting ready to start another season. So it's, uh, you know, and, and the other organization could have kept going had they, I think had they not overspent or over, you know, maybe they weren't, maybe some of the the backers weren't in it for the right reason. You know, they were, they weren't in it for the love of the sport. Maybe they were in it for a financial gain, which was never my base. My base was just because I love the drivers. I love the, the sport. And, you know, it has to make sense financially because you can't, you can't lose money putting on races, of course, or at least not consistently. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, you're going to have it. Uh, you know, like when you're starting out, you're going to lose money. But then if you do it right, then it's going to come back around. Correct. Uh, but no, I agree. It's I. That was one of the reasons it was really hard for me to leave Welch Wars because I freaking love doing races. And, you know, laying out courses and talking to the drivers and you know just seeing the smiles on the faces of people even when they if they break you know there was a, there was a guy at Tennessee this last year and he broke in a UTV and he was a new racer it was his second race and I went out there to him and got him pulled off the course and uh, he's like thanks man I'm like no problem that's what I do I want to make sure you're safe he goes no 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 he's like thanks for for doing all this he's like i love this so thank you and he was all smiles and he broke and that's the that's the thing that's the stuff that just it makes me love doing it right and that's that that is for me what i believe my legacy is it doesn't matter the accolades i get from from people in in public ever no matter what happens in the future, as I, you know, start to step out of the the role that I've played for 21 years, I'm not looking for, you know, 
recognition or fame or fortune or any of that kind of stuff. I've learned to not I've learned not to do that. But it's the it's the the people that we've been able to put together and the relationships that they've built because of what the events that we've put on and then also you know the the technology and the businesses that have that have grown from doing it you know that's that's my legacy i th- feel and i'm hoping that dave and yourself and anybody else that that is on the non-racer side understands that as well yeah you know, no i definitely do and um you know these the family that I'm working with now, um, Jason Robinette, Gail Robinette, and then all of their extended family there at Mid America. Um, they they have that glint in their eye about racing, and I love it. <laughs> so it's and I they understand that, and I, I think it's going to be really good. I think it's going to be awesome for the racers. That's cool, and the, and they have the wherewithal. It appears to to make sure that that it's a it's going to be a class act. I mean, hiring you to to facilitate that, of course, is is a huge step. But also the way they have, I've not been to their park, but I've heard a lot about it, and everybody raves about it, like like you were doing about the infrastructure and the layout, and you know they're not afraid to put some money and effort into building no you know, not at all quality no and that's what we're going to do on this on this series the the races aren't just going to be races they're going to be events so we're going to have live music and we're going to you know have hospitality and it's it's going to be good it's um i think it's going to be a lot of fun and so besides the american off-road endurance what else is in the future for jt um well you talked a little bit about the airboat thing um i am gonna still pursue that uh, american airboat racing it's gonna be the first time anybody's ever done it is endurance racing with airboats and we're gonna try to do it or we are gonna do it on the red river in between oklahoma and texas and i'm we're looking at about a 150 mile race wow and yeah (laughs) so that one uh i think is gonna be a blast that's interesting the uh Yeah. yeah whatever we can do to help you on that one you know me i like to i like to experience all sorts of different things so yeah, well, I think I know. Besides freezing our butts off, you and Shelly had a good time when we went airboating down there, like Simi. Oh, I loved it. I was gonna. I wanted to buy an airboat. I was looking, <laughs> and then we left there, came to Port A, was hanging out with Josh Jackson, and yeah. then we uh, with Rick and BB White, we we wintered um, or did a Christmas vacation last year here, and. We tried to, you know, the COVID extended our season. It, we didn't get started as soon. So Shelly was like, okay, what are we going to do now? We didn't want to leave the area. So I said, well, you know, we were looking at condos, that kind of thing. And I said, you know, we could live on a boat. And she goes, yeah, we could. Three weeks later, we were moving on to a boat. <laughs> I love it. Now I got a big enough boat. You know, it ain't an airboat, but I can live on it. That's all right. You can go riding on my boat anytime. All right. It's, uh, here in Colorado, we're uh, finishing up a motor swap on it. I blew up that LS2 that right. you rode in, and we're putting in a over 600-horse LS3 and doing the injection and doing the fuel system and putting lights on it and changing a bunch of stuff. So looking forward to getting that thing done. We fired it the other day. James Schofield helped me with the tune, and um, we fired it up, and I'm hoping to put it in the water in the next couple of days and uh, go finish the tune up and then do some heat cycles on it, make sure everything's good. And then it'll be time to take it down and pre-run that, the red river run. Well, cool. If you do that before, uh, before the beginning of February, let me know. Okay. We'll no, see I if will. we can uh, come out and meet you guys out there or something. 
Right on. I'll keep sending your airboats for sale, though. <laughs> you know what? I actually, Shelly said I can't buy any more boats. <laughs> <laughs> now, this is our starter boat because uh, I realize without diesels and some, you know, like a fresh water maker and an ice machine and to, to repower and do the things I'd really want to do with this, it's going to cost me, I might as well just buy a boat that's already got those. So yeah. this will be our starter boat. We'll sell this. We'll move into another boat. But we want to do the, the Great Loop. Oh, cool. And, uh, you know, go from here down around the Keys, up the eastern seaboard, you know, through the Erie Canal into the Great Lakes, and then down the river systems back to Louisiana. So, yep. You can sign me up for a leg or two of that. I'll, I'll come uh, cast the line. Awesome. Awesome. Sounds great. <laughs> so, um. What else besides the river racing? You got anything? Is there is there a bucket list thing you haven't gotten to? I mean, we could probably talk for about six hours if we got into all the stories with you and Dave in Europe. And did you make the China trips? I did. I made one of them. That was okay. a, um, it. Was so much fun. I mean, there's so much that we could talk about. We may have to do another one if I can nail you down again. <laughs> It only took us like six months to make this one happen. I know. I apologize. <laughs> no, no. You don't need to apologize. You're a busy man. Um, the one bucket list thing that I am working on, um, I've already raced Pikes Peak uh, three times, but I'm going back. I want to go back on the mountain. And um, since it's all paved now, nothing of my four-wheel drive stuff will work anymore. So, or It will, but just it's not as fun. Right. So I'm building a 67 Coronet RT into a hill climb race car but it's gonna be a street legal race car so um full tube chassis a hellcat demon 840 horse supercharged crate motor with a six-speed manual uh tremec <laughs> so it should be a uh, a handful and what year body 67 so are you gonna acid dip it and get it a little lighter no, I actually want to kind of keep it heavy because I'm going to also do uh, Silver State. Wow. And Big Bend and Gra Sand Hills Rally. Wow, and cool. My, my goal is to break 200 miles an hour. Whoa. Yeah, I know. I just, <laughs> for some reason, I got it in my head. I want to be in the 200 mile an hour club. <laughs> that's awesome. That That's so, a great goal. I, it should be fun. You know, and I've I've got a line at uh, Skip Barber, so when I get the car done, I'm going to actually go to school and learn how to drive on the asphalt again because it's been a really long time. Um, I raced, uh, in Ger when I was in Germany, I raced at Nürburgring, Hockenheim Rink, and at Spa in Belgium. But that's been a, a lifetime ago, so i got to get, get tuned back up and learn how to drive, you know, two-wheel drive, big horsepower on the asphalt, so... Um, I think it'll be a lot of fun. Do you think drifting would help in some of that? I don't know. I talked to Vaughn about that uh, several months ago, and um, and he's like, I don't think that that what I do is where you need to to look. He said, I think you need more. I said, but your car control is amazing, and I said, right. and that's and he goes, yeah. And he said, but when you're racing, he said, you don't want it stepping out he's like you want to be able to control it and you know when it does step out then you have to have that car control to gather it back up i said okay that makes sense yeah and he said he even told me that the you know a skip barber or then even going to uh, o'neill's or dirtfish would help that because you're racing on the dirt well because we're also i plan on putting some of those new hoosiers that look like the pike speak specials right underneath the back of this car and go race lands in so that's that's a dirt hill climb right and it's my favorite favorite road it is so much fun um but that was the first first time anybody took a rock buggy and went hill climb racing with it was uh, myself and uh jack went over to race lands in val val actually talked me into it and I was just kind of funny. She's like, you should bring your car over here and race hill climb. And I'm like, yeah, whatever. But then I got to thinking about it. And then I got some Pikes Peak specials and lowered it down and strapped it down and went over and ran it and did pretty dang good. And it was a super blast.
<laughs> it's so much fun. And then uh, when I think we had 19 Ultra 4 cars that showed up that one time. Right. And, um, it was uh, that was a lot of fun because Mooneyham was there and um, Levi and Brian Shirley and um, Kevin, Kevin was there with Big Ugly. Lauren was there. Uh, Jesse was there. I mean, we had we had a bunch of bunch of heavy hitters uh, show up for that race and uh we had a blast and we got to the top on the last run and uh i'd lost brakes like halfway up but still stayed on it but i it bothered me i thought i'd lost some time so i got to the top and mooneyham was up there and he's on his radio to the guys down at the bottom and i didn't have anybody down at the bottom it was just me and matt thompson and uh he kind of looks over me goes hey taylor i said yeah what's up he said, what was your record on this hill? And I'm like, oh. And I couldn't find out what the times were until I got back down. And I had won. I, you know, I won the, the run and broke my own record. But Mooneyham, man, he had me sweating. I thought he got me. <laughs> well, didn't he be- beat your old time? But you ended up winning, beating that time and your old time? Yeah, he did. No, he he stepped it up. He got me, but then I that last run, Matt and I, like I said, we lost brakes, but we hung it all out because we knew we had to. And yeah, we beat the fastest time. We beat, beat Mooneyham and all the other guys and set a new record. That's awesome. That's so cool. Yeah, <laughs> it was a good time. But yeah, Mooneyham got me, man. He had me sweating. <laughs> Sweet. Sweet. Well, cool. I don't know, um, except for individual stories on stuff. I think that we've touched pretty much everything in your across your spectrum. Yeah. Is, no, I've, I've had a good time, man. I appreciate you uh, having me on, I'm, and um, look forward to to hearing it out there. See how it does. Have you ever thought about coming out and uh, and trying to fit through the cones? You know, I did. I did some rock crawling. I did that uh, the sports in the rough thing with Bob Hazel back okay. in '98. All right. And then I did a little bit of the stuff with uh, Ranch early on. All right. Um, in my Toyota, but then when it got to where it was courses that were, you know, just buggy courses, and I was going to destroy my truck, that's when I I backed out and then started doing the the go fast stuff. Like I enjoyed it. Um, you know the the technical side of that and the courses that you guys built was, it was hard, you know, and it, and challenging. It made you think. So I don't know. I might be talked into coming back out and do some cone dodging. Awesome. Need to get you and, uh, and Lovell out there. Oh, that'd be fun. Brad was an amazing driver. Nope. Oh, still is that dude. Good, good people. Um, he and his brother and, and the whole family, just good people. And, um, yeah, amazing, amazing driver. Well, JT, I want to say thank you so much for coming out and uh, being available on this uh, Friday morning and finally getting this interview done. We'll <laughs> have to do it again one of these days that we're sitting there either in uh, in Florida or in Colorado Springs with you and uh, do a live interview and do it over again with uh, with more story-based and uh but i want to say thank you so much for being the friend that you've been over the years i i will throw in one thing camo and i were coming oh yeah (laughs) across mexico from mike's to from the east coast to the west coast when we'd spent the night at mike's and we were just kind of we were on camo time you know just just having a good time and not being in a hurry or anything. And we get to El Coyote and all of a sudden I hear somebody yelling for me and I'm like, who the hell knows that I'm out here? <laughs> and I turn around and there you are. <laughs> I know that was so funny. Cause I'm like, we're in like deep middle of nowhere. Bah. Yes. Cause the El Coyote is not on the beaten path. You got to want to get there. Yes. And I see a dude get out of the truck to open the gate with a We Rock hoodie on. And I look, I'm like, holy crap, 
That's rich. <laughs> <laughs> It's always yep. amazing the people I come across in Mexico that I that you know I don't think about that would be there. Yep. And no. that no. was you that time. <laughs> That's a great story. <laughs> so anyway, thank you so much for coming on board and being the friend that you've always been and all this I can only wish you all the success that you ever wish for as you move forward in life. Well, thank you, brother. I really appreciate it. And uh, as always, mi casa, su casa. Awesome. All right, buddy. We'll talk to you later. All right. Thanks, babe. Okay. Bye. If you enjoy these podcasts, please give us a rating. Share some feedback with us via Facebook or Instagram and share our link among your friends who might be like-minded. Well, that brings this episode to an end. Hope you enjoyed it. We'll catch you next week with Conversations with Big Rich. Thank you very much.